Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to this year's Skirball Family Autism Conference um, and thank the Skirball Family Foundation and our planning partners for making this annual event possible. I'd also like to thank our wonderful speakers for sharing their expertise with us today. Uh, my name is Valerie Smith. I have light skin and long dark brown hair. I'm wearing a gray sweater and sitting in front of a light pink wall. Before introducing today's fabulous speakers, I'd like to review some quick uh, housekeeping notes so we all know how to participate in today's webinar. Um, first, by clicking interpretation at the bottom of your Zoom screen, um, you can switch into the Spanish room for Spanish live interpretation. Uh, we also have English captioning live um, by clicking on the closed caption button and then view transcript or subtitles at the bottom of your screen. All presentation materials uh, that will be shared today as well as a recording of today's presentation will be available on our event website at Developmental Behavioral Pediatrics. Um, there's the link there, but we'll make sure everybody has access to materials afterwards. Attendees today are in listen only mode. So that means that your video and audio are automatically turned off. However, if you have questions throughout today's session, um, please use the Q&A box uh, to ask questions and we'll be answering those um, at the end of today's presentation. Uh, and lastly, we really value everybody's feedback from today's session and the other sessions of our conference. So following the conference, um, everybody will be receiving an email with a link to an evaluation survey. Um, and you're welcome to request a certificate of attendance within that survey, and we're happy to provide that to you. So it is now my pleasure to introduce and welcome our speakers for today's session presenting Mind the Gap, a caregiver-focused program to help families navigate a new diagnosis. Um, Susanna Idarola is joining us today. She's a psychologist and an associate professor of pediatrics. She specializes in evaluation and intervention in autism spectrum disorder. She's also the director of our Strong Center for Developmental Disabilities, where she conducts community partnered research aimed to support individuals with autism and their families. Ann Sheriff is also joining us today. She's a parent of five adult children, three of whom have a developmental disability. Anne has worked as an advocate, reading teacher, self-direction broker, and a parent consultant. She's very active in many community activities at our regional and state levels. Um, and also we have Janine Garfield joining us today. She's a parent of three children aged 18 uh, to 28 years old. Her 26-year-old son is on the autism spectrum. She has a background as an elementary school teacher and quit her job to run an in-home family child care program, which we love. And since then, she has worked as a CPS investigator, child care licensor, and a child care center director. So without further ado, I will hand it over and welcome Susanna Ann and Janine. Thanks for being here with us today. Wonderful. Val, thank you so much for the introduction. Are you able to see the PowerPoint? Yes, looks great. Okay, perfect. Um, huge thank you, Anne and Janine, um, true partners in this work. So happy that you were able to join and share your experiences and expertise as part of this program. So um, Val, that was an amazing introduction. Hi, I'm Susanna. I'm a psychologist by training and I do a lot of research uh, with and with the community um, for people with developmental disabilities and their families, really with a focus on trying to improve health equity. And I will invite Anne and Janine to say hello, introduce themselves, and please add anything else that you would like to. Um, I will also add that I am a white woman with olive complexion skin. I have brown eyes, long brown hair, and I'm wearing a blue and white striped shirt. Anne, would you like to introduce yourself and add anything else you'd like us to know about you? Hi, um, my name is Ann Scherf and I have white curly hair. I'm wearing glasses. I'm wearing a um, blue turtleneck with a dark blue, light blue turtleneck and a light dark blue um, coat over that. And I'm in a room that has some pictures on the wall behind me. Um, I think uh, Valerie covered it well. I One of the things that I've done over, over time is volunteer across systems. And 
which has been a wonderful uh, learning experience because knowing how one system functions helps me to ask questions in other systems. And um, one of the things that I've been very involved with is system change for my, not only my sons with disabilities, but for other people that I've met across the time. Thank you so much, Anne. Janine, hi, good morning. Would you like to introduce yourself and add anything else to Valerie's introduction? Oh, you're muted, Janine. Of course that was gonna happen. <laughs> uh, good morning, uh, my name is Janine Garfield. Uh, like I, like um, you said, I have a child who is not a child anymore, but is on the spectrum and have worked with children um, of all different backgrounds and in a childcare setting where children are diagnosed with autism um, more typically than uh, later in life. So I really have a passion about this and working with uh, people uh, who need this type of services. So I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much, Anna Janine, for joining. We're really excited to talk to you today about Mind the Gap which is a caregiver support intervention that's designed to help support families following a new diagnosis of a developmental disability for their child. And this work is conducted as part of something I'm going to reference as AIRB, but you can see at the top of the slide that that stands for the Autism Intervention Research Network on Behavioral Health. And I will describe a little bit more about AIRB as we go. Here are some of our team members for AIRB. We are in our fourth iteration of this funding through the Health Resources and Services Administration, or HRSA. HRSA is really focused on health equity in all populations, and AIRB is specific funding to promote health equity in individuals with autism spectrum disorder and their families. And as a network, we have all decided to kind of um, extend that beyond just people with autism and to other developmental disabilities as well. Here are some pictures of our team, although we are always growing and changing over time. I also want to highlight that our work in Airbnb is done as part of a national network. And so we have partners and I will talk about all of our different sites and I'll reference um, the work that's being done across sites. And here are the sites, these are our partners. So the University of California in Los Angeles, the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, University of California Davis is in Sacramento, the University of Rochester here, the University of Washington in Seattle, and the University of Kansas in Kansas City. And we also partner uh, with Drexel University, which is also in Philadelphia. So as I reference our, our site partners, this is who I'm talking about. Um, and I, I think it's really amazing to have work that's being conducted across the nation and to know that this kind of support is really being extensively evaluated and implemented on a large scale level. So Mind the Gap is based on this idea um, that came from and with the community that there are support needs for caregivers following a first diagnosis and that oftentimes families feel like there is a long path ahead of them. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we as a network developed the priorities that were set for Mind the Gap. Um, but then I'm gonna invite the people who are the real experts, Anne and Janine, to share their perspectives on why this is important as well. So we know that for all caregivers, support is helpful, but we also know that there might be particular groups who experience additional barriers. The system is not well designed to engage everyone in an equal and equitable level. We know this. There are documented disparities based on things like race and ethnicity, language of origin, family income, as well as things like living in an urban or rural area. And so appropriately, a lot of recent criticisms of autism research is that when we do research, especially intervention research in large scale studies, we're seeing the same people come back to research over and over again. And those tend to be children whose families are white, high resourced and educated. And so HRSA and this Airb network was really, really uh, committed to saying that that's not good enough. And we need, if we really want to know how, how interventions are effective in communities and we really do want to address health equity, 
We need to be conducting research that partners with everybody and is inclusive of everyone. And so we decided with our community partners to create something new. We wanted to set out to develop a new caregiver support intervention to address community experience, experiences and concerns. And we didn't wanna do this with just our idea sitting at the medical centers and at these university centers with what we thought was important. And so we used a partnership model. We engaged in this work from the beginning with our communities across the nation um, and those community partners included people who were important to this work, parents who have already gone through the system, self-advocates who had identified as a person with autism or an autistic adult, stakeholders in the early intervention systems and the school systems and providers, people who, who understand what the challenges are in these circumstances. And these partners were engaged at all stages of the intervention. We met regularly. We ha had their... Um, their input in how we identified the priorities of research. We co-developed interventions with our partners, and then we took their input in, in the sense of how we should test them and whether we would know if they were effective in real world settings. I mentioned that our community partners were critical in the identification of priorities for this research. And so what we did is across the country with our four initial sites in Los Angeles, Sacramento, Rochester and Philadelphia, we conducted extensive focus groups with these key stakeholders with um, an emphasis on valuing the perspective of parents most highly and ask them, when you think of disparities and autism, what comes to your mind and what are the biggest challenges that you're experiencing? And the goal of these focus groups was really to hear from families who are not typically engaged in services or in research for their children with ASD. So making sure that these focus groups had representative samples that mirrored the populations in which we work. And they identified a couple of main priorities. One was that there are significant difficulties with service access following a first diagnosis. So you might have waited a really long time and it might've been really difficult for you to even get that diagnosis in the beginning. And then after that, you were kind of left out into the world and said, go get your child services and early intervention is really important and you need this many hours a week, but there isn't really someone to hold your hand and to help you understand and learn and navigate that system. So that is one of the priorities that was identified. And within that priority, our partners also said, here are some additional considerations you need to think about. And these, these themes kind of were pretty equivalent across the country. So no matter what community you were living in, we were hearing the same things. One is that if you really wanna make sure you're providing services with equity, you need to consider the cultural sensitivity and the cultural context of the system. And here's a quote from a parent to highlight that. I think if we're focusing on minorities, I think that at cultural matching helps because they could understand, and as a professional, they might be compelled to understand as well. We know that in our systems, many of our providers are not necessarily from the neighborhoods of the people that we're trying to engage in services. So this was very powerful. The other thing that came up was the idea of peer support. It's a lot different hearing information from somebody who's just like you, who has lived your experience versus hearing it from a practitioner. That having another parent say that a service is important is much more meaningful to many families than hearing a provider say it. And so we wanted to really attend to these identified priorities as we developed a new program. So here's where I step back and hand it over to the experts to kind of share your perspectives on these priorities and why you think they're important in your own experience. Janine, do you want to start? Sure, I can start. Um, I, as, as a parent uh, a long time ago, and my son who's now 26, um, went through all this and uh, even coming from the background that I have, which is an educational field background and working with special education in particular, still felt like I was lost trying to navigate this system that I got thrust into. Even though I had background in special education, I felt like I 
was turning myself over to um, say that I couldn't do it as a parent, that I'm failing and needed help. So coming from that, that standpoint to try and navigate the process, even though I had some familiarity with it, if I had someone that was in my particular circumstance or that knew the system or what I would be facing, it would have been um, super valuable to me at the time. So having an ability to be that for someone else is um, fantastic. And just even having a person to have those families speak to me and have me listen to their, their journey is powerful. Thank you so much, Janine. Hi, uh, I don't consider myself an expert. I, I think when my oldest son who's 47 was diagnosed, um, I, I had made a decision that I would learn as much as I could about people with disabilities across the lifespan. So that meant going to conferences and trainings and um, because I also have a master's in education, I could go into some of the educational college courses and I, I could understand the lingo and I could talk to lingo. So that helped me gain information and ask questions. And the dream was always that as much kind of normalization and not segregation for um, all three of my sons. Um, so, so that was kind of the background and I didn't have a, a lot of experience growing up um, with peer, although I did, I should say I, I had experience with two peers growing up uh, it was in the neighborhood. There was um, a girl that was my age that had um, German measles and she had traumatic brain injuries as a result of that. And then there was another girl that was in my 4-H club together and she had CP. And I can remember the, our leaders saying, you know, give her time. And we gave, we learned to give her time and she could do what she could. So having that experience and having a grandfather, a grandfather who had hearing loss and a grandmother with a um, vision loss, um, disability it was kind of the natural piece of um, my environment or culture. So having children with disabilities and um, going through the process, I didn't have uh, other parents support at the time. I met professionals mostly over the course and I learned from them. Um, but having the lived experience of growing up, it made me ask questions and, and really push for other kinds of opportunities that um, for all of my sons and my, my daughters as well um, who don't have disabilities. But I guess that kind of <laughs> sums up as far as where's the, you know, what impacted me um, with having children with disabilities. Thank you for sharing your stories. I'll be um, asking Anne and Janine to kind of jump in and certainly anytime you wanna to add to what I'm saying, unmute and I'll keep an eye on it. Um, so, you know, with these priorities identified, then we set out to develop this community partnered intervention called Mind the Gap. And again, I can't stress enough how much this was truly co-developed in collaboration with our community partners across the nation. So this was conducted in collaboration with these community stakeholder groups. And again, they had input into the intervention that included the content, the format, the structure. And we tried to use an iterative process, meaning that we would develop parts of the intervention and then we would bring it back to the group and share it and get their input. And then they would tell us all the things that we got wrong and all the things that we missed and all the wording changes that needed to happen. And you use too many acronyms here and this needs to be in plain language. And it was so meaningful um, to be able to refine the intervention in a way that we felt really would be truly responsive to community feedback. And so we would take it back and we would refine it and bring it back to the community over and over until we felt like we were in a place where we were all in agreement that this was a good solid intervention to be used in the real world. And that took a very long time, <laughs> but it was incredibly rewarding. Okay. And so thinking through like Mind the Gap as an intervention, what are the most important things to focus on? Um, again, these goals were identified by our partners. 
And so one of the goals of Mind the Gap was to help with service access. So the idea is that with a diagnosis of an autism spectrum disorder, you were eligible for services that you might not have been before, or you might not even have been receiving a high level of services prior to the diagnosis. And so we wanted to help families um, be able to navigate the system in a way to get enough services for their child based on what would be appropriate for their needs. The other goal was helping families claim their natural power. So that means how are we capitalizing on your advocacy skills and your ability to be um, an empowered advocate for your child across systems? And so those were kind of the overarching goals of the Mind the Gap program. In terms of how we accomplish this, we, I'm first gonna talk about content and then I will talk about the structure. The Mind the Gap program included a series of modules. These modules included information and resources and activities around particular topics. And all of these topics were identified by our community partners, again, emphasizing parent experience and parent expertise. Parents told us that there are two modules that they thought were foundational, like these would be the most important things that families should engage in following a first diagnosis. One is a deeper dive into what is autism spectrum disorder or ASD. And so we heard a lot of families say that they received a diagnosis, but they didn't necessarily understand how that, what that meant for their child or how their child specific profile met criteria for autism. So that is one of the things that we did. And then we had a foundational module on navigating the system. And those were um, site specific, right? Because the California system is very different from the New York system. Additional modules were organized around things like parent rights and advocacy, particularly within early intervention and the special education system, insurance, coping and stress management, because a lot of parents highlighted how important it was to support their emotional experience following a diagnosis, addressing challenging behavior, helping children learn to communicate. And then a lot of communities talked about stigma, family stigma, intergenerational stigma, community stigma around disability um, and parenting. And so we felt that it was very important to have some work that could be done with families around that as well. All of this information in the modules is shared via a coaching model. So each person worked with a coach or a nap, we call them navigators. And the idea was that this navigator had 12 sessions so a session meaning a point of contact with the family over the course of four months. This structure was informed by our partners. We wanted it to be um, like frequent enough to get through the material, but not too much of a burden. And so they did it in person or via Zoom or via phone calls once per week with the goal of about seeing the parent once a month in person. And they presented material, answered questions, helped the parent set goals, identified challenges and help to troubleshoot them and then reflected on progress throughout this, uh, throughout this program. The key feature of Mind the Gap is going back to this priority that we need peer-to-peer -peer support. We want to work with someone with lived experience who we have natural trust in. And this was important to us as medical providers also because having parents work with people from their own communities helps to address some of the historical and very understandable mistrust in the service system. And so instead of working with a provider to receive information, parents worked with a peer coach or a peer navigator, meaning other parents of children with ASD or developmental disability. And that's how Anne and Janine are involved in the project. They were two of our amazing peer navigators. We really tried to specifically address barriers that have been reported to us before for engagement in this kind of ongoing program. So we tried to be really flexible. We were flexible around scheduling, around communication, and around how if parents navigated through the content. They got to choose what was important to them. If they felt like stigma wasn't re relevant to them, then we didn't make them go through that. So we let it be very parent-led. We tried to make information accessible through translation into multiple languages, and so Mind the Gap was available in English, Spanish, and Korean. 
And then we tried to engage in a good coach matching process, meaning that we tried to identify what are the characteristics that would be most important for you to have in your peer coach? Do you want them to um, have the same gender child as you? Do you want to talk to someone with a young child versus an adult child? Does the race or ethnicity of the person matter? Do you want someone who speaks your heritage language? And we did our best to kind of do that pairing. So again, trying to reduce some of the barriers that we know exist for families. So I'm hoping that Anne and Janine would be willing to share a little bit about what it was like to be this peer navigator. What was that experience like for you? Um, I can go first. Um, first of all, it's, it's just wonderful to be able to be connected with some of these families who are going through some of the same struggles that I went through and to be that ear um, and to be that support person when they know that I'm coming from the same place that they're in currently. So to be able to have that person to uh, call when you need to call them or be able to meet up with them face-to-face -face once a month uh, was just, it was a blessing for me as well because knowing that you are doing something that is really appreciated by a family is such a rewarding process selfishly for me but that person um, and those families that I worked with were genuinely so happy to be able to have that person to be able to bounce some um, scenarios off and what do I think about something and and have that um, professional kind of relationship but with a person who really knows the particular struggles that they might be going through. Thank you, Janine. Even um, when my children were young, not having that parent support um, was a piece that I missed. And I, I gained it over time through different organizations and, uh, and a parent to parent relationship and as far as other parents understanding where it's at um, and being supportive in that way. So as a, um, a peer navigator or, or coach, um, it was interesting. The first person, I, a mother I was connected with was, um, she didn't care what culture or what age the child was, but um, I went one time and then I went back the second time because I, I felt it was better to meet in person and that's what I tried to do each time because I think that helped um, form a, a relationship that doesn't happen necessarily on the phone or as easily by Zoom. And there was cars there, but no one answered the door and I waited and I called and no one answered. But and then she called and said that she wanted someone of the same culture. And so they found someone in the same culture and then she wasn't right either. So it was a, the situation where <clears throat> the parent wanted someone to come and fix her child. And we were not there to fix the child. We we're there to help support them um, because their child is still their child. Their child hasn't changed. She's just, has a label and the label doesn't mean you should love your child any less because he is your child or she is your child. Um, there was an, another situation where I, um, I'd gotten an, a parent that was had been with someone else and the, the, it was a phone kind of situation and it, it wasn't working for her. So we, we met um, at a place, uh, it was at Tim Hortons and um, one time she forgot um, to um, come and so I called her and just checked it to remind her and she says will you wait for me and I said I would and she came and she was so apologetic and I said it's okay and she had said to me if she'd been the one waiting she would have been furious and she wouldn't would have stomped out so ability to give people some flexibility and grace because I forget things we all forget things and I, I think that's important it goes back to relationships with, which I found meeting in person with the um, parent is important and a third situation that um, I had a, a parent with a developmental disability and both her children had developmental disabilities one had autism and um, so it was looking how to restructure the material so it would be more accessible for her and the approach to her. She ended 
uh, we are, I didn't finish the, I don't know if there was a couple sessions left, but she called and said it was too much. And I think she was feeling stressed uh, out about um, having to do it. And again, having, I think the curriculum needs to be flexible to allow for learning styles and, and um, capacity um, because even if they only walk away with one thing, which I think is most important that their child is still their child and still someone that they love. And um, yeah, the child hasn't changed, it's still the same. It just has a, a, a label. Thank you both. I think you're doing such a beautiful job of highlighting the importance of individualizing both what parents receive, but also how each relationship is really different. And that emphasis on the relationship that you're saying is so important. Um, I'm jumping the gun a little bit here, but family <laughs> said that was the most important part of the, of the process as well. And these stories are really showing why that is. Janine, sorry, were you gonna add something? Um, I just, I, I'm still in contact with um, one of the uh, families that I worked with. I think that kind of speaks a little bit about how important it is. And the fact that we can be this community of people and be that support and, and be there on a continuous timeline. Um, so it's not just a, a one stop here. Here's your paperwork. Um, I hope you can fill it out. And you really make that community connection to let other people know that there are other people out there that are there to support you. Um, and to be able to match, match those people up, I think is just such a, a wonderful thing. I love how you say that a community of people. Um, and again, like that, that is where we want to go ultimately at the end of this presentation, I'll talk a little bit about how we're trying to make that happen. Um, but your comments also reminded me that there were a decent number of parents who, after going through the Mind the Gap program, said that they wanted to be peer navigators now for others. And I think that speaks to this idea that these types of peer-to-peer -peer support programs are ways that you can start to build capacity and build entire communities of people who can provide the support. Absolutely. Okay, so we developed this program and we loved it and <laughs> we implemented it. And our partners also had to have a lot of input into like saying, what, how are we going to assess progress and how are we going to assess, assess success with the program? So we need to know if it works, right? Because if we develop something wonderful, but it's not really resulting in outcomes that are important, then we need to think about restructuring what we're doing. And so we engaged in a testing and refinement process that was in multiple phases. The first phase was a feasibility study. So this was with a very small number of people, just a couple families across our four sites. And we wanted to look at things like, could we get people into the program and could we keep them in the program? To what extent were our peer coaches using the model to fidelity, meaning they were implementing it in the way that it was designed? And then what was everyone's satisfaction? We were interested in family satisfaction and also the satisfaction of our coaches because they're such an important part of the program. So with this very small sample of nine families, um, we had a 78 completion rate, meaning 78% of families stuck with it until the end. Um, our, we know that our coaches did an amazing job having fidelity uh, or adherence to the procedures of the Mind the Gap program. So anything above 80% we usually think of as quite high. And so that was uh, a good outcome here. And then we had good satisfaction on behalf of parents and coaches. And I will show you some data also on engagement. And we define this as both the number of sessions out of 12 attended and the percentage of sessions out of 12 attended. So you can see that on average, um, including the one family who kind of dropped off after the first session, we had parents attended an average of 10 sessions, which was about 84% of sessions. And families were not required to do all 12. Again, this was supposed to be parent directed. And what we ended up finding is that most people wanted almost all of the sessions, if not all of the sessions, which again, I think speaks to this amazing relationship that the peer coaches did building with, with, uh, with families. 
So uh, although we had good overall attendance, you know, we have to acknowledge that there's always barriers to engagement. And so I'm just curious, Anne or Janine, um, if you have any thoughts about some of the challenges that you as peer navigators or peer coaches saw um, in terms of engagement with the program. Um, I don't think I necessarily had, I had um, families that really wanted to participate and, um, wanted even more sessions than we had. So just continually talking, um, which is absolutely fine. Uh, but I, I had a family that had, they were probably an hour and a half away from me. So it was a, a distance. So wishing that I could be closer so I could be more available in person. Like Anne was saying the in-person meetings are so, um, I think a little bit more meaningful uh, when you're there sitting on their couch with them and they feel more um, an ability to be closer to you and, and um, relate more. So I just think the, the only real barrier I had was, um, was physical location, but everyone was pretty, pretty willing to either meet offsite or have me come to their house. Um, uh, so that was, that was fine for me. Thanks, Janine. Can you rephrase the question again, Susanna? Sure. Um, what were some of the challenges that you as a peer coach saw in terms of families' experience with doing or completing the program? Okay. Um, one of the challenges was them following through um, with the, uh, you want to call homework assignments or what they needed to um, I, I, from a parent, I understand you feeling exhausted and overwhelmed, um, putting sometimes another piece of, of work on your schedule makes it a challenge um, to compete. So if they hadn't done it, there was no, you know, you know like, um, it, it was okay because we could do it together. And it wasn't like, you know, you didn't do follow through. So, <laughs> you know, not being supportive versus, you know, negative about the lack of response at times and kind of understanding that with, again, if you have a lot on your plate, it's hard to, to do some of the stuff. Um, some of the challenges I mentioned, the one that um, she wanted someone to fix <laughs> and none of the coaches could come in and really fix her child and make the autism go away. Um, and, um, you know, sometimes people aren't ready um, to receive the support that will help them to kind of move forward. And it's coming to a point for themselves. The um, contacting them at times was a challenge of playing phone tag or whatever and um, getting there and they're not there or they forget. So and it's, again, I think about, uh, it, it, it comes down to having patience with people that are going through a challenging time. And if they don't show up, um, if, they don't answer the phone that it's okay. And one of the things too, we talked about the lack of, if a person didn't have um, um, minutes on their phone, if they had um, providing support, so you weren't using their minutes up for a meeting. So I saw that as one, well, and we had discussed that is how to support them with that also. I think as far as the challenges, that was it. But I, I guess at the bottom line, I felt that being flexible and allowing them to talk, and it, it's not about me, not about my story, it's about their story and maybe impossible showing the struggles that I have gone through with my sons and the outcomes that have come regarding this, those struggles, the positive outcomes. Thank you. And I mean, you know, you're you always in every every context um, come back to that idea of things being OK and giving the grace around it. And I really do think that that's that's an example of something that parents are able to do for each other in a way that we as providers forget to do or don't always do or it's not meaningful coming from us because we don't walk the same walk. Um, so that that really just does highlight why that's so meaningful coming from you as a peer coach. So we were happy with our pilot, but we also got and deliberately solicited a lot of feedback because we knew we were scaling this up to a much larger study. And so we wanted to make refinements. And so 
we conducted some qualitative interviews and analysis to identify what was most important for our refinements for the big study. And um, we had more, the list was longer than this, but these were kind of the primary uh, priorities. One was to even do more to increase the flexibility of the sessions, um, improving the, the assessment process to facilitate better coach family matches, and then simplifying data collection because it is a study and we've asked um, particularly our peer coaches to take data and it is very overwhelming. And so streamlining that process would help with participation. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the large scale study now and it had a little bit of a different um, approach. So I'll talk more specifically about who we included. We were working with families who had a child who was under nine years old with a new-ish autism diagnosis and new was a term used very loosely. <laughs> um, and again, because the priority was to engage uh, families who are not traditionally represented in research, we enrolled only people whose family income fell at or below 250% of the federal poverty line. So families who were living in low income households. And again, because our Mind the Gap materials were only available in three languages, parents had to be fluent in English, Spanish, or Korean. Now, when we do these large scale studies, our funders like us to compare something new like Mind the Gap with something else. Um, and so within this project, families were randomized, meaning like we basically flipped a coin and they had 50% 50 50 chance of making it into one of two groups. One group received all of those Mind the Gap materials that we described before, activities, modules, content, worksheets, resources, and that was all they got and they used them in a self-directed way. The other group received Mind the Gap plus the peer coaching. So the materials were all the same, it's just did you have a coach or not? And then we asked both groups to complete measures. We enrolled 133 families and that result across those four sites and that resulted in um, completion of eight, 118 participants. So we had a 13% withdrawal rate, which is actually pretty good for an intervention that requires a 12 session commitment in our experience. And we screened over about 286 families in total um, and they didn't all meet inclusion criteria. And the primary reason for not meeting eligibility is that their income was above that threshold. Again, it's not that we don't think this program isn't gonna be helpful for anyone, but we, for everyone, but we really wanted to make sure that we were being very intentional about engaging underrepresented families. We asked them to complete some measures. So we did things like look at their service access. So we had a sense of how many services they were accessing before and after the program. We measured a couple constructs. One is caregiver agency or how often the caregiver is engaged in activities related to promoting their child's development within the service system at home, at school, all of those things. And then we included an autism knowledge scale, which was assessing kind of knowledge of features of autism, information related to the diagnosis and related interventions. And then finally, we conducted something called the Social Dynamics of Intervention Interview or the SODI. And this is an interview that helps to identify the social network or those people who are involved in supporting that caregiver as it, is, as it relates to their child. And so social networks are these people that surround a particular person around a topic, in this case, helping their child access services. We are still in the process of doing like the post treatment analysis. Um, I can give you a little bit of a preview, um, but those are almost done, but not quite. Um, but I can tell you a little bit about what happened at the. The other thing we were really interested in was what do we know about caregivers just following a diagnosis? There isn't even really that much information um, about these topics. And so we wanted to know just basically who, who was enrolled in the sample and what was going on with them in terms of like what kind of services were they accessing before they received the help. And then we wanted to know about how do different factors affect service access? Like, can you predict who's gonna have higher service access based on things like what language is spoken at home? What is the size of that person's social network? And then what is their knowledge and agency like before they engage in a program? We're really interested in reach. And so if you look at those 118 families, here's some breakdown in terms of demographics. 
So we had good diversity of race and ethnicity. Um, we had about a third of people identifying as white Caucasian, a third is identifying as African-American black, and then 37% who identified as something else or multiple races. Consistent with kind of diagnostic patterns, we had about three quarters males versus a quarter females. And you'll see a pretty decent range in family income here. And you will see that there are some income brackets that are a little bit in the higher range, but to qualify for the study and still be below that poverty line, that meant that they had multiple people in the household. So someone with an income of over $50,000, for example, in Los Angeles had to have eight people in the household that they were supporting. So this really does support good diversity of sample. This is showing who spoke English as a primary language. And so yes is in green and no is in blue. This is identified across the sites because as you can see, it's different depending on what city you lived in. So in Rochester and Pennsylvania, the vast majority of people spoke English. In Sacramento, more people spoke English than not, but we still had a good percentage. And in Los Angeles, English speaking families were in the minority with the vast majority of families speaking Korean or Spanish. These two charts are showing the average number of services that the child was receiving at entry to the study, so before the program. 87% of people were receiving at least one service. However, there's a big breakdown between community services versus school services. So more people were receiving school services, on average 1.34 school services, compared to less than one service on average of community-based services. And you can see that the number of people receiving one, two, or three services at school was much higher than in the community. So we know that families are not receiving a ton of services at the start. This was prior to the diagnosis of autism. We wanted to look at what was going to predict service access. And so there was one construct that ended up predicting who was likely to have more services. If you had a larger peer support network, you were significantly more likely to have more services. And the mean network size was about five people in the network. Some of the other factors that we thought might have been predictive, language spoken at home, race, ethnicity, autism knowledge, and caregiver agency, these things did not predict service access, in our sample at least. We did a little bit of a deeper dive and we ended up also breaking down our sample into two groups. One group were those who had no services at the start of the study, and the other was a group that had at least one service or more at the start of the study. Because we were curious, like what's really different about people who have been able to at least access something versus people who have had no success in accessing services. In families who had at least one services, uh, at least one service. Um, at UCLA only, non-English speaking families were more likely to have services than English speaking families. The reverse was true at every other site. <laughs> at every other site, you were more likely to have services if you were an English speaking family. So that also shows that sometimes when you try to average across different contexts and communities, some of these important differences wash out and you really need to pay attention to the individual characteristics of your community. So in terms of our bottom line, we felt like we were pretty successful recruiting a diverse sample. We identified that social networks really do matter and that having that type of support is more likely to result in service access. And when we think about language disparities, they were held up at three of the four sites with the exception being Los Angeles. We also felt like this showed that our partnership um, really did a good job of informing how this study should have been conducted 
And it also helped us engage families to an extent that it showed that this program would be helpful to continue in the future. And I also want to just pause and let Janine and Anne share any thoughts on kind of these findings that they might have. No pressure. Um, you know, luckily, I was pretty successful at um, fitting with the, the families that I was paired up with, uh, who spoke English like me. Um, and um, had worked in uh, settings where people didn't necessarily have a lot of access to a lot of things because they were more poverty stricken areas. So um, having knowledge in, uh, I think how people relate and um, knowing where they might wanna meet versus um, meeting somewhere that they don't have access to, somewhere that's on the bus line and things like that. Some, when they're more comfortable, they um, feel better about sharing and asking questions. So it, uh, it was great for them to um, be able to feel comfortable enough with me to, to ask me to meet wherever they wanted to. Thanks, Jenny. Yeah, I think that's important, allowing them to have control of the, the setting um, because they can, if they're, it's in their own home, if that's where they're choosing, they're in control where you're not as, as a visitor and that the comfort level is there. Um, this one mom didn't want to meet in their home and which is fine. It says, you, you pick the place and which she did, which was Tim Hortons and we worked it out. That worked fine for her and for me. It's being flexible, I think. Um, one of the things about belonging to in the community, my youngest son is deaf and has autism, and so it creates other challenges. Um, you know, because he's not accepted in the deaf community, he's not accepted in other communities. So it it creates barriers, and it's looking for ways of connections for communities um, and relationships. And it's it's like one on one connecting, and and I I, I think in listening and um, being supportive of where they're at. Uh, I, I go back and think about when you talk about new diagnosis, um, our sons were diagnosed, had a new diagnosis in 2017 um, of a genetic um, disorder that uh, was supposedly rare, but I don't think it's rare. I don't think it's diagnosed um, or it's missed, but I thought about in that process um, of going through this uh, again with, you know, something, a uh, diagnosis. And, thinking about they're not changed. It, there's just more information that might give me some different options or opportunities um, for that. And one of the things that I encourage the families that um, I think they felt limited and unable to maybe participate in the community and the what I did at the end of um, when the sessions were over at the, at the end, I this um, one person in particular family that I kind of figured out something they might like to do. So, um, and there was a pizza hut close by. So I got her a gift card for pizza hut. So she could take her son out and try to experiment, bringing him out into the community and doing something that she hasn't done before with him. So if it didn't work out, she wouldn't be out any money, um, but she had that opportunity to try and hopefully it was successful. Thank you. Thank you. These like comments about the connections, I think, are so critical. And again, it kind of relates back to this idea in the findings that the social access you have and those social networks are so important. And so even though we're still looking at the like what happened after Mind the Gap data, um, I can say that I can share a couple of things. One is that um, the relationship with the peer navigator was identified as the most important part of the program. Like more important than the material itself, <laughs> which makes sense. Um, and then also that parents who got the coaching aspect versus who only got the materials, they had higher um, perceptions of empowerment within, specifically within accessing services within the system following participation in Mind the Gap. And so I'm really excited um, and hoping that we can kind of like get our final permissions to share some of those data soon. Um, but again, like if we know that care that support networks matter, 
this is who you are. You as the peer coach are an additional person in that support network and, and a very critical person within that support network. So now that we are at a point where um, we are really happy with our intervention as a whole, it's time to scale up. This is what we're doing now. Um, we have a new round of funding to work on dissemination of Mind the Gap through community agencies to help support them through the, the implementation process. One of the things we hear a lot from our communities is that research is frustrating because we come in and we develop really great interventions and then the grant runs out and we go away and the intervention goes away. And that's sometimes worse than not having it in the first place. And so with this new round of funding, instead of trying to make something new again, we are focused on taking certain interventions like Mind the Gap that we know are helpful and working on how do we create capacity in the community to implement over time. So we are conducting this through an implementation science study. And what that means is we're asking questions like, how do we build capacity in local agencies who see real people in the real world? And how do we help them learn to provide Mind the Gap? How do we help those agencies break down access barriers especially for families who are from historically excluded groups? And how do we plan for sustainability over time so that Mind the Gap as a program is successful and also lasts beyond the life of this grant? Those are some of the questions that we're trying to answer. I can share what we're doing so far. We just finished our first year of this more implementation focused project. And so we're starting, like just starting our work with the communities. Um, but one of the things that we've done is make additional refinements to mind the gap. We were responsive to feedback that these materials are helpful, not just for parents of children with autism, but we should expand to other disability diagnoses, which we have. We also ad identified additional um, language populations that would be important to reach. So we have translated the materials into Chinese and Punjabi also. And given our COVID context, and to increase access in rural areas, we are using a complete virtual model, um, including virtual training in the Peer Navigator Mind the Gap program. And that's like for the agencies, you know, navigators are still free to see families in person if they like, but agencies are engaging virtually with us. And again, because we have to compare something to something else, um, we're comparing again, two approaches to Mind the Gap. So agencies are getting either um, mind the gap as usual, I'm going to describe what that is in a moment, or something called UNITED, which is an implementation intervention. And UNITED stands for Using Novel Implementation Tools for Evidence-Based Delivery. So let me share a little bit more about what those are. Mind the gap as usual means any agency who participates with us gets a few things. They identify a team who's going to be their mind the gap team. They get all the materials in any language that they want that we have available. We provide virtual training for their peer navigators and their administrators and anyone else who wants to get trained. We provide coaching for those navigators and monthly supervision meetings. And then we're there to support in any other way that's needed, materials and resources. So any agency gets all of those things. Half of the agencies will get randomly put into the United group. And so they also get a couple of additional supports. One is more meetings with us, um, specifically with the agency's leadership team. And the leadership team is supposed to do things like create an implementation plan. And that is a plan that's designed to identify the possible barriers to doing Mind the Gap at your agency and how we're gonna address those. And we provide ongoing support and troubleshooting around how to reduce barriers and increase success and sustainability over time. That will occur in a couple of initial big meetings and then monthly with the leadership teams. And that's where we are right now. We are in progress. We had developed that United Implementation Intervention in our first year, and we just started our second year, which means we we're just starting to work with agencies. Um, so we're one year into a five-year process and really excited to continue to share our progress 
and get your input. We also have a community research partnership, again, like you've heard a lot about, that continues to inform our work. And we are always happy to welcome new members into that community partnership as well, as a provider, as an agency representative, as an autistic person, as a parent, whatever role you have, we are happy to welcome you into our partnership. So I am going to end with a thank you to all of our site partners and families and those who support this research and also invite Anne and Janine if you have any closing comments. I just think it's this is just such a valuable thing to provide to communities and to people who kind of feel lost and can get that support. Um, it's, it's just super valuable. So thank you for, for doing this. Thank you, Janine. Yes, thank you for doing it. And I, I one thing I wanna add that um, one of my, I learned over the years as far as advocating and getting supports to my children was to ask for more, ask for the perfect picture. And I knew what my bottom line was, but the systems didn't know what my bottom line is. So we could both kind of meet in the middle, but I was really getting, what I'd hoped for and support families to reach out and ask questions, um, even ask questions if they know the answers because they might hear something differently. So it's important to encourage them. It's important to speak out. And when my, they had early intervention when one of my, my young, youngest son was born, the EI was around and that was somewhat supportive, but it was not the same as having uh, a family member or someone that had, had walked the walk um, being able to connect and that, that's very important. Wonderful. Thank you both for joining and sharing your expertise and experience. Um, that is all our prepared information. And so if there are questions in the Q&A that can be shared, we'd be happy to take them at this time. I do have a couple questions for you guys. One is um, how can parents sign up for um, Mind the Gap? So in the past, you would let me know and I would make it happen. Uh, one of the things about shifting Mind the Gap to the community is that we're, we're putting control over the program into the community's hands. And so um, there are agencies locally that are gonna be engaging with us around this. Um, I can talk about one so far because they're the ones that have you know, started this process with us. Um, but that's Starbridge. And so if you are familiar with Starbridge or if not, we can provide the information in a follow-up. Um, but they are in the process of kind of scaling up to be able to provide this uh, Mind the Gap to the community. We're also working with, with groups across New York State. So we're working with some groups downstate um, and we're always looking for uh, new agencies who are interested in potentially providing Mind the Gap to their communities. So if you are a provider or connected to an agency that you think might be interested in providing Mind the Gap, please, um, my email is on that slide, but I'll put it in the chat as well. Uh, please let me know because we would love to explore and are definitely, um, we have the capacity to work with more agencies at this time. So would that be a good way for say providers and teachers to also contact you if they have a patient or a student that would be a good fit for this program? Yeah, if, if it's easier, you can get in touch with me and then I can try to connect you with agencies who are working with this program right now instead of trying to find the information for multiple groups. Um, we also had a question. Um, what about children who have been diagnosed um, later and also have um, are, you know, a complex developmental um, presentation? Um, what would you recommend for those um, patients? I'm so glad someone asked that because one of the primary questions that we're receiving from agencies that we're trying to work with around Mind the Gap is, well, do they have to be under, not, under nine years old? And so um, I'm going to say two things about that. One is there's a lot of information included in Mind the Gap that will be perfectly relevant for a parent of a child um, who is older. And we are saying to agencies that they're completely free to like pick parts of Mind the Gap that they think could be helpful to parents of older children and use them. 
some of the content really is geared toward younger children. And so as we um, embark on expanding Mind the Gap as a program, I think we've received enough feedback to say that it would be worthwhile thinking through expanding our content of Mind the Gap to be relevant for older uh, children at some point in the future. Um, it's not a priority or it's not identified as the goal of this current cycle, but I could easily see us taking this on in the future. I'm not sure if that answers the question. Yeah, if, I think that's a great okay. one. Are you looking for new parent navigators or mentors for Mind the Gap at this time? Oh, that's a good question. So again, like it's, it's, it's a little tricky because we're, we're not the ones supporting the navigators. And so the navigators are people who are working for a community agency. There are a lot of community agencies that use the navigator model already. So this isn't something new, like we didn't create the navigator model. We're just acknowledging that it's really helpful. Um, and so I would say, again, if you're interested, reach out to me directly. I'm not our group isn't able to like bring on navigators because they need to be associated with an agency, but it might be that we work with an agency who doesn't currently have navigators who's interested in being connected with someone who wants to take on that role. And so we could be the facilitator in that way. So again, contact me via email and I will learn more and see what we can do in terms of connecting with agencies. Great, I think well, that's enthusiasm. <laughs> Yes, thank you guys so much. This was a fantastic presentation. We really appreciate you joining us. So we'll let everybody um, break for lunch, but thank you guys again. Thank you so much for your interest and for having us.